Good evening, I'm Dick Gooding and I'm your host for this evening's edition of Veterans Remember. Uh, Veterans Remember uh, gives local veterans here in Hopkins an opportunity to share with our community uh, stories about their uh, growing up in the military, uh, both in wartime and in peacetime. Uh, HCAM TV has been uh, gracious enough to give us veterans the opportunity uh, to present to you and we hope that uh, your children will get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about our military history and uh, a little bit about some of the people who have served. Uh, with me this evening is uh, Dick Bro, who's a, a close friend of mine and uh, uh, certainly someone that uh, most people have seen in town uh, over the last many, many years. He's been active in, uh, in uh, uh, some of the community events and is uh, again, a, a close friend of mine, and uh, Dick reminded me as we were walking in that uh, a few years ago, probably 10, yeah. uh, I was on the Board of Selectmen that appointed him uh, uh, to be a member of the Senior Center Committee. And right. uh, of course, it's with pride that we look at the Senior Center, and uh, we veterans have an opportunity to utilize those services uh, on a pretty regular basis. So Dick, welcome uh, this evening to Veterans Remember. Thank you and, very much, uh, Dick. Uh, we all know that, you, that it'll be very uh, easy for you to tell us some of your stories and uh, we'd like uh, uh, very much to give you the opportunity. Uh, one of the things that you shared with me right off the, right. the, the get-go is that uh, your family uh, is one that is uh, a remarkable uh, testament to service of the military mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to uh, flash a picture here of uh, of your family oh, and, right. and those of you who are who are participants uh, in the service and perhaps you can uh, sort of give a little introduction and then uh, we'll move from there. Well I can Dick because all eight of us served in the military in various services between the period of 41 to 45. This is, this is my brother Jerry, this is my brother Dennis, my sister Rose who sang in the USO camps throughout the country, this is myself, this is my brother Bernard who was lost two or three times in the, in the Chesapeake Bay, Bay Area, he was torpedoed three times on different uh, troop ships. This is my brother Clement, this is my brother Jalos, and this is my brother Paul. All eight of us served with honor during World War II. I have here that I'd like to share with the people in Hopkinton. In uh, August of 1945, I received this book from Elizabeth Kilbride. She is the author of the book which is called America United, A Generation Sacrifice During World War II. I received this book and then I, I opened it up and the author, Elizabeth, wrote this to me. To Richard Brault, thank you for your service to our country during a link of time in our history. Your service helped some serve so many for, from t t tyranny. You are a true patriot. God bless America, Elizabeth Kilbride. This <laughs> book also can be found at the high school library. They have a copy of it. And I would urge anyone here in Hopkinton to pick the book up and read about the sacrifices that were made by the civilian population during that entire period of World War II. And as I recall, Dick, there's an, an entire page devoted to your family. Yes, there and, is. And uh, with all the pictures that we just showed and then a little bit of a story yeah, as well. Page, on page 68 is a picture of all the, all the brothers and my sister. And the author wrote this book primarily to depict that here's one whole family that came home from the war. And then the next page over, she depicts 
His one whole family, all five brothers, were lost on the USS Juno. So it, it only shows you uh, what, what, what actually can happen during a war that is unbelievable in the aspect that it produces scenes such as this. Like, for example, say Private Ryan in, 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 in the uh, European campaigns. You all are very familiar with that movie. Now, what I'd like to talk to you about is my experiences, and by the way, I'm 83 years of age, so if I don't get all the, all the dates correct, bear with me. There's no quiz at the end? There's no quiz at the end. Thanks, Dick. No. <laughs> uh, I entered the Marine Corps in January of 44 and went to Paris Island on a train and we got off at Paris Island and the first thing you know we were put on cattle cars to take, it, to take us into the base itself. And all along the trail of the base there were recruits either graduating or young recruits halfway through, most of them halfway through, and they all were hollering and shouting at us you'll be sorry. <laughs> so that was what we were greeted with. And uh, after Paris Island, uh, we, we got an emblem with the Marine Corps seal printed into our hands by the uh, sergeant. And uh, the, uh, we were shipped out to Camp Lejeune. And as John previously told you, there were no, no barracks there. All we had was tents. We, we lived out of tents. So we went on training as an, I went on training as an artillery man. And with the 10th Marines, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. Uh, we, uh, we got shipped out of Camp Lejeune on a train as a replacement battalion and crossed the country to Camp Pendleton. And then... So you went on the same trip that... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, that John. Uh, Dick. I really, I really wouldn't be surprised. Of course, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have known me because I came from New Bedford and he came from Hopkinton. But it, it's quite possible. It is quite possible. Because uh, when, when we were arrived in Hawaii aboard a... Uh, a troop ship, we were separated at Hilo. Uh, I met the members of the 2nd Marine Division in Hilo after they had just come back from Tarawa, where one quarter of the 2nd Marine Division was lost in three days. These guys had it. And in Hilo, I met a lot of men there were combat veterans, and I had never been in combat before. They told me stories that were, scared the hell out of me. But we prepared to invade the island of Saipan on June the 15th, 1944. They actually told you in advance that you were aboard, going to do that? Aboard ship. Yeah. They told us we would... Oh, aboard ship, aboard so the, ship. the word couldn't uh, get out right. anywhere. Aboard ship, we were, we were told that Saipan had a garrison of 10,000. But in reality, there was 30,000 soldiers on Saipan. So the intelligence group wasn't uh, particularly up to, up they, to snuff. They didn't have the accuracy of what we were going to be faced with. And it was typical of any of the... Uh, islands that we hit in the Mariana groups. And uh, the, uh, on June the 15th, with June the 16th, June the 15th, the, the, the 6th and 8th Marines landed on Red Beach 1. This is 1944, Dick? This is 1944, Dick. And uh, it was in, in the latter part of the, they landed in the morning and they made inroads 
100 yards, 200 yards in. And we went in around 5 o'clock that evening with, the, uh, with our pack howitzers, the 10th Marines Dog Company I was with, 2nd Battalion. And we set up our, our, our pack howitzers about 50 yards in from the water line. And we dug a trench. And this was all under small arms fire, mortar shelling, uh, you name it. They, they threw everything at us. They had, they had from Mount Turabacho, they everything zeroed in. Every little inlet was zeroed in with their cannons and their mortar shells and their 81 millimeter mortars. So help me God, Dick, I didn't think I was going to live through it. Huh. I was so scared, I peed in my pants. <laughs> I won't mind telling you that. Because it's a pretty, it frightening, pretty frightening experience. It was a frightening experience. And mm -hmm. even to this day, I have the nightmares of it. Uh, that first night, I, we, after we dug the, uh, the gun pit, we put bags and rocks, anything around the gun pit, too, so we could all hucker down. And it was that first night of experience where uh, a destroyer just off off the the shore was with flares, flares going off all the time, all night long. You don't sleep. Now the flares were because they trying to flares, light up? Were they trying they to light, light up, up the, the area so that you so could that see your targets? If any infiltrators tried to come through into our gun position, we could take them out with our machine gun units. The, uh, the, uh, the flares themselves were horrifying in the respect that uh, here you are hucking, da hucking down and you're trying to look over, the, over the, the bags that you've built up in front of you and they create shadows. It creates shadows and you swear those shadows move. And it's a frightening, very frightening experience. So anyhow, we, we survived that first night, and it wasn't until the day, daybreak started that we started getting shelled from the, uh, with the uh, 81 millimeter cannons from the other side of the mountain. And uh, uh, we, we, six and eighth Marines were, as I say, were 100 yards, 200 yards up uh, in front of us. And our Ford observers were giving us field order, field orders that would to sm fire smoke grenades, smoke shells. You set you, this uh, the 75 millimeter cannon. You can fire smoke, armor piercing, or fragmentation. And it all depends on what they call for that we put into the cannon. And those, those orders came down rapidly. And we fired so much smoke, it was unbelievable in the morning. And what was the smoke meant to do, Dick? The smoke was meant to hide the 6th uh, and 8th Marines when they would move up to one pillbox after another to try, try and destroy it so they wouldn't be seen. So they were able to eliminate those pillboxes and it wasn't until D plus two before we were able to move our cannons up to where they were on, uh, towards uh, the area called Garapan. It was the only city that was in, uh, 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 in, in Saipan that would had uh, vast numbers of civilian population. And by the time we got there, this was all annihilated. I mean, I can't describe, and you can't see it on your pictures, but the smell and the flies, they were, un it was unreal. I mean, you try to take a drink of water and the flies were over the cover of your canteen so that when you went to take a drink of water, you had to chase them away to get a drink of water. 
and I mean they covered the top of it. We moved up on D plus two to an area just, just south of Garapan. And the firing that went on all day, all night, it was unreal. They, uh, they annihilated an awful lot of people, Dick. An awful lot of people. So much, most of this you was artillery remember, and mortars. You got to remember, also too mixed in with all of these civilians mm -hmm. was the Japanese soldier, and he was such a well-trained individual. He never wanted to surrender. You had to go in and dig them out. And I'll tell you one thing right now: a flamethrower has no conscience. It really does the job. We were able to dig them out of caves with those flamethrowers. Oftentimes, uh, have you ever heard of satchel explosions? Certainly have. All right. They, at the entrance of a, of a cave, you'd get one Marine that would run up with a satchel, pull it, and throw it into the, uh, into the cave entrance. And, Shortly after it explodes, you get two or three soldiers come right out. And they, they weren't about to surrender. They had their rifles in their hands and their, and their guns, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't drop them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't raise their hands. Maybe they couldn't understand us. So, so it was an elimination. And that's the whole uh, idea of war, is eliminate your enemy before he eliminates you. Right. So we uh, traveled all the way up through the, what they call the Plains area, just north of Garapan. And what t how many days was, was this? This is a period of 10 or 15 days 10 or 15 now. 15 days? Yeah, right. the, because the campaign itself lasted until uh, um, July 1st or 2nd or something like that. So and it was well over a month. Well over a month. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when, you, when you look at the statistics of how many young men we lost out of the division, over 6,500 young boys. And progress was measured by and inches we lost, and, and we feet. Lost, I can't tell you the number of officers we lost because these, these men were trained to be right with us all the time. It was, it was an honor to call you an officer, a lieutenant, or a captain, because they were great people, great. I was proud to be a Marine with them. And after Saipan was secured, we had to go back with our pack houses to an area called Moppy Point, have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't, Dick. Well, Marpy Point is, an, is the easternmost part of Saipan. It had cliffs going into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it was here in which a lot of the civilians, population, were committing suicide instead of surrendering. They would throw their children over the cliff, and then they would jump over the cliff. Mm -hmm. The bottom of the beach area where they all jumped into was littered with thousands of bodies. Huh. I, I can't describe that yeah. to you. And, and yet, when they wouldn't, wouldn't raise their hands or surrender, we had orders to fire on them point blank with our pack howitzers. And that affected me a great deal. Because these were not soldiers, these were civilians. And it horrified me. But I obeyed orders. Now, after Saipan, we uh, built a, uh, an area with the, with the CBs because they were already building the uh, B-29 fields as soon, mm -hmm. as, as soon as Saipan was secured because uh, Saipan was only 600 miles from uh, 
the mainland of uh, Japan. So those B-29s were right within range. The, uh, we had a bivouac area that, that they set up for us, with, which was 10-man tents. You lived out of tents a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure. Uh, but uh, the, uh, and then on July, July the 23rd, it was saddled up again. We're moving out. So we all moved in into LSTs with our pack howitzers and our, our um, and what they call the um, alligator crocodiles, uh, the uh, Amtraks. Uh -huh. we'd, we'd have our pack howitzer in there and all 13 guys would get in there, uh, a gun crew. And uh, we hit the beaches at Tinian, which was the neighboring island. And Tinian was taken in uh, uh, nine days, seven or eight, nine days, somewhere around there. And we, we there again, we still lost a number of men. I consider 1,900 young boys a lot of men sure. and over a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we got back into our, after that was secured, Tinian was secured. We went back to Saipan on our LSTs and, and started training for the next little project and that they had arranged for us with uh, General Smith and uh, our, our, our Colonel, Colonel, uh, Colonel Wallace. And uh, then we, told us to saddle up again. And everybody went, where the hell are we going now? <laughs> this was close to April the 1st. It was uh, just before April the 1st. So we all were aboard LSTs, and we were in an area where we started seeing kamikaze planes crashing against around, onto our capital ships. And this was on April the 1st, it happened to be the island of Okinawa, uh -huh. which was only 300 miles away from the mainland of Japan. Right. And the uh, LSTs that we were on, we were disembarked on the Amtraks with our guns in there and everybody doing their thing, which they had to do with with the battleships and the cruisers firing away, and and uh, and and, you, and 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 it was a a situation where we were doing this fake landing mm -hmm. on the on the on the southern part of Okinawa, so that Tenth Corps, which was the Army divisions, could hit the northern part of Okinawa, and hit the beaches without being because we, we drew all the Japanese soldiers down to the southern end of the island. They thought we were gonna land there. Right. So it was a, an April Fool's joke we pulled on the Japanese soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it was back on the LSTs, back again to Saipan. Well, I guess you know. We no sooner got our packs off when we landed back in Saipan, I put my gear on my cot, and it was saddle up again, boys. We we're off and running. Off you go again. And off we go again. So we were back again on the LSTs, and we went back to Okinawa, and it was just below Naha that our gun battery, Dog, Dog Company, 2nd Battalion, was sent below Naha to support the 11th Marines, which is part of the 1st Marine Division mm -hmm. that was on, uh, um, not Marpy Point, but uh, Shir Shiri Castle area on Okinawa, was, was, which was a, a, a bastille of tunnels and caves that went down 100 feet into the, into the mountains. Right. And we gave the 11th Marines the support from our pack houses. And during that period of time, which was a period of nine consecutive days, 
we had 10th Corps commander Simon Butler, uh, uh, but, uh, Simon Butler, Butler, I think it was Butler. No, I can't think of his name. Buckner. Buckner, Buckner, Simon Buckner. I came up with our Colonel Wallace and he was standing just before the CP tent of our, all the pack houses, which were, we had 12 of them all lined up. Right. And some Japanese soldier infiltrated with a knee mortar through the lines and he could see the cannons firing and he started sending mortars our way. And it happened to be a mortar that landed right between Colonel Wallace and General Buckner. Huh. And it killed him so quick. Wow. It was unbelievable. Huh. So he, he found that we, uh, we can operate pretty well huh. as Marines. And, and it was after that, after Okinawa was secured, we were back on those LSTs again, going back to Saipan to get ready for the invasion of Kyushu. Which is, which is Japan. Which was Japan. Yeah. And that's, as a matter of fact, let me tell you something. When the war ended, VJ Day, guess where I was? Where? I was six foot in the ground digging a head out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't get out of that hole fast enough to celebrate with the guys. It was a it was a wonderful experience.